Hello, and welcome to the Engaging Youth in Creating a Healthier Future for Themselves and Their Communities webinar. My name is Zoe Broder, and I'm an AmeriCorps VISTA with the University of Missouri Extension's Healthy Lifestyle Initiative. HLI works with community members across the state of Missouri to develop healthy communities with policies and environments that support access to healthy food and opportunities for physical activity. We collaborate with local government, public health agencies, business leaders, economic development and planning commissions, local food and farm groups, schools, youth, and churches. You can find out more information about the Healthy Lifestyle Initiative by clicking the link on the presentation slide or by visiting extension.missouri.edu slash healthy life. HLI is dedicated to ensuring that youth have a strong voice and are empowered to participate as a member of their community. The participation of and engagement of youth in today's communities has become widely acknowledged as an integral part of creating the next generation of positive, healthy individuals. Currently, I am promoting a youth engagement guide that I've been working on this past year with Healthy Lifestyle Initiative as well as in collaboration with Missouri 4-H. I posted a link to the guide on the slide you are currently viewing. The guide is an extensive tool that covers a range of youth-related topics. The first section addresses positive youth development and approaches to working with youth. Positive youth development means that during child's learning experience, inclusivity, involvement, understanding, and a sense of belonging are all present. The next section, Engaging Youth in Healthy Eating and Physical Activity, includes various contributing factors to childhood obesity and ways we can work in our communities to combat this issue. Another section covers the importance of engaging children in nature and the outdoors and how we can work to prevent nature deficit disorder. The term nature deficit disorder refers to the disconnection many youth have with the environment and stems from the current generation's tendency to focus on built and engineered entertainment rather than the natural world. A great example of engaging youth in outdoors and combating nature deficit disorder is the Southern Boone Learning Garden in Ashland, Missouri. Their mission is to provide outdoor space and resources to facilitate fun, authentic learning experiences that challenge students to embrace positive life skills and to promote collaborative efforts between the learning garden, the school district, and the community. Focusing on youth gardening and environmental education, the Learning Garden works with students in the preschool through fifth grade at the Southern Boone Elementary School. During the school day garden lessons, youth are able to make hands-on connections to existing classroom curricula and learning objectives. They gain increased exposure to and interest in fresh fruits and vegetables and increased hands-on learning and physical activity during the school day. They also have an after-school club which focuses on teaching basic gardening concepts and skills while providing increased exposure to and consumption of fresh fruits, vegetables, and whole grain foods. Garden-based nutrition provides hands-on opportunities for youth to be physically active while also learning about where their food comes from and the importance of nature. Steps to creating a youth-centered community garden are available within the guide as well. Also included in the guide are tools such as youth-adult partnerships, ways in which youth can empower each other, experiential learning, and diversity. In these sections, the guide covers various ways in which youth can develop diverse relationships and learn the importance of building capacity while creating stronger communities. Diversity is of particular importance when engaging youth. In this section, you will also find a compiled list of suggestions designed to help teach youth about the value of diversity and how to resist prejudice and discrimination. Practicing tolerance and acceptance both inside and outside of school provides youth with the ability to be comfortable with themselves. In the risk management section, potential problems, harms, and challenges while working with youth are addressed. This section contains a sample first aid kit contents list, event activity incident report, and event risk management plan. Youth councils, overcoming barriers, and engaging youth at meetings, and Missouri Forage programs are also discussed within the guide. Many of the sections, such as diversity and experiential learning, include hands-on exercises and activities to help in applying the concepts and tools discussed. At the end of the guide, you will find an organizational support tool for youth engagement, as well as a compiled listing of youth programs within the state of Missouri. One of the main purposes of this guide is to encourage the engaging of youth as strong community builders. When youth are given the opportunity to be part of the decision-making and planning process of initiatives and programs, they are allowed the responsibility and independence to become empowered individuals in their communities. With this tool, 
HLI is able to give a voice to issues that youth are facing on a daily basis as well as find solutions to these problems. During this webinar, we will be discussing Missouri Photo Voice projects with K-12 schools, youth-led community forums, participatory action research with youth, and youth adult partnerships. Both youth and community practitioners will be able to take the tools learned here today and apply them in local collaborations with 4-H schools, food and farm groups, local government, and more. Here with us today to speak about youth engagement and creating stronger communities, we have Steve Hennis, State 4 H Specialist at the University of Missouri. John Stemmel, Assistant Professor in the School of Journalism at the University of Missouri. As well as Melissa Maas, Assistant Professor in the College of Education at the University of Missouri. If anyone listening in has any technical questions during the webinar, please type them into the chat and we will be able to respond. I'll now be handing it over to Steve who will be speaking about youth-led community forums. Thank you, Zoe, and uh, good morning to everyone out there. I hope you're doing well. Um, we're delighted to be with you this morning and to talk about uh, several uh, examples of youth engagement and how uh, those uh, have uh, fit and meshed with the uh, Healthy Lifestyles Initiative. Um, I kind of see this group as a dream team of sorts that uh, Zoe has organized and brought together for this webinar. Uh, we are uh, primarily campus-based uh, faculty with teaching and extension and some research appointments, um, but I think a very engaged group, as you will see uh, through the course of the presentations. And um, I, I want to be, be sure and also point out that um, the, the folks that uh, really uh, deserve the credit for uh, the yeoman's uh, share of this work are uh, many extension field faculty, uh, many community leaders and stakeholders um, who have really uh, been on the ground in making this happen. So we've had a small part in that, but we wanted to give them uh, every due credit. Uh, the Healthy Lifestyles Initiative uh, for our presentation uh, team this morning has been a common point. Uh, we have been all involved in one aspect or another, uh, but I wanted to be sure and point out that the scope of work uh, represented by the, the Healthy Lifestyles Initiative of MU Extension is, is much larger uh, even than you're going to hear today. Uh, we don't uh, want to attempt exhaustive coverage of that, but hopefully we'll give you a slice of, of what made it up and again some uh, key, key things to think about in terms of, uh, of youth engagement. So with that, um, my objective for about the next 15 minutes or so is to introduce you to the idea of youth-led community forums and we'll talk about the what and how and why and uh, how you can apply that uh, to uh, your work in communities. Um, so for the initiative, a little bit of background on it. Uh, it was an initiative of MU Extension and statewide. Uh, you can see the map of our state there in the corner uh, with the, um, the purple or pink counties as lead uh, communities which uh, were initially involved and uh, then other counties became involved later in the process and those are represented in green. You can see geographically a pretty uh, big mix. Uh, Missouri is a very diverse state uh, regionally, but uh, definitely representations from, from, from some very small and rural areas as well as uh, some of our urban uh, core areas on, on either side of the state. Um, extension faculty from 4-H, from Human and Environmental Sciences, Ag and Natural Resources, Community Development and Business Development, um, all were involved um, at some level or another uh, in this initiative. Uh, trying to help communities in their existing efforts to move forward um, with, uh, with uh, projects that made sense as well as some policy work in places. Uh, some of the community issues that really seemed to, to cook to the top included uh, local food access, nutrition, physical fitness, safe routes to school, and healthy environments. The initiative really took a task force approach, so communities were guided in forming task forces of stakeholders, and then uh, those task forces were uh, prepared and trained uh, to uh, complete action plans and to develop projects related to their areas of interest. And we wanted to point out that, uh, of course, the uh, the, the, the big interest was on capacity building over time and supporting these groups in these communities, both with resource generation, um, grant writing, as well as community policy. Um, and then, of course, what we're here to talk about today is youth engagement and the role that that played both in the process and then also um, 
uh, structurally uh, keeping it going over time. And so let's talk about uh, what is youth engagement. Um, in essence, I think perhaps a lot of folks are familiar with this. Uh, there has been a lot of work and a lot of uh, research devoted to uh, this topic in recent years. And of course, uh, 4-H youth development programs uh, are, it, it's at the very core of our mission uh, to create youth and adult partnerships and to, uh, to create spaces for young people to uh, be contributing to their communities. For youth engagement, we're referring to involving young people in meaningful ways, purposeful ways, across a whole spectrum of activities, uh, from identifying issues to helping shape strategies, to plan, implement, and evaluate programs and other actions around those issues. So we're really talking about youth involvement uh, throughout the whole process of uh, community development. And uh, today in particular, we're gonna talk about uh, that involvement upfront uh, on uh, the identification of issues and community discussion and dialogue over those issues and how that can be a very important tool uh, for community-wide uh, health initiatives. In fact, uh, we found through this work that youth engagement is really essential to the success of those initiatives for a variety of reasons which uh, we will um, touch upon in a few minutes. And uh, in particular, youth-led community forums are uh, one part of youth engagement placing young people out in front in visible leadership roles where they initiate and facilitate the community conversations. And uh, that's a, a very, uh, very powerful um, uh, practice. Um, so let me talk about what inspired uh, this approach and kind of, I guess, my level of involvement uh, with the Healthy Lifestyles Initiative. I had some direct involvement with some communities, uh, some more indirect. Uh, and my involvement overlapped with some other work uh, that I do here as a state 4-H uh, specialist uh, with the 4-H Center. Um, as you can see from the project examples represented, uh, there were a number of uh, gardening efforts, uh, there were a number of urban agriculture efforts, as well as some other efforts uh, related to uh, creating uh, a youth center in Scotland County and in Rawls County uh, efforts on the part of the County Extension Council to involve youth in its decision making. Uh, and so uh, what we learned I think early on in this process of seeing what communities were doing, what they were interested in doing through this initiative is that we really were uh, in need of more tools and more resources for youth engagement, especially uh, beyond and outside of maybe the conventional ways of involving youth, uh, say through service and service learning and uh, through or in the implementation of projects that had already been decided on. So really the goal was to try to discover more ways to do with youth and uh, less uh, just for youth. And so in particular, uh, what we found uh, was the community forum approach. So let me talk for just a moment about uh, what those are and um, uh, what they meant for, uh, for this uh, initiative. The, the idea of a forum goes a long way back in the American tradition, of course, uh, town hall meetings, and we associate uh, gatherings of citizens uh, uh, as a, a key foundation to our democracy and, and to uh, decision making and how things get done. Uh, community forums um, in this setting uh, were very much the same. It was about citizens uh, gathering together uh, to identify issues, to have dialogue, and to inform uh, collective action. Uh, perhaps the difference is that youth were at the center of these efforts, and as you can see in the pictures, uh, invisible leadership roles for the process. Um, one thing to point out, though, with forums is that uh, success does not necessarily mean a group reaching one decision or maybe even having agreement on the issue, but rather uh, a process that leads to everyone better understanding the issue, seeing it from different sides, uh, understanding different perspectives and opinions on it. So part of the challenge is helping groups uh, who want to have or reach one decision uh, come away uh, just comfortable that they have enhanced their understanding of things. Uh, some examples of some community forums and some topics that we uh, developed and worked with communities on included uh, hunger in schools, uh, science readiness, youth civic engagement, and then also uh, poverty. 
What I want to do now is kind of give you a, a look inside uh, a community forum led by youth and how uh, this was set up. Um, as you can see, there are three parts to it here. On the left are the, the, the uh, roles that team members play. And so uh, as we work with groups, uh, typically, we would uh, invite two youth to be the moderator or the facilitator of a forum. We would have two youth uh, who would record uh, the forum and uh, do that with flip charts, uh, uh, taking notes on, on what was being shared. Um, at least one timekeeper to help uh, the process uh, stay on track. Uh, a couple of observers whose job primarily was um, to watch uh, the, the group uh, participating in the forum, observe both uh, verbal and nonverbal uh, communication, and kind of track who was uh, participating, especially if it was a combination of youth and adults. And then, of course, there was room and space for other youth group members to be interspersed throughout the audience and actually participating in the forum. And, and certainly also to mention the role of adult leaders and, and guides. Um, so as you can see, uh, for a group of, of youth, um, perhaps 10 or fewer, um, we were able to uh, set, set them up in these roles and um, help them to, to practice and to be comfortable with these roles in advance. It was also important to encourage them to switch roles so they got to try out different, uh, uh, different aspects of the forum and uh, that enhanced learning as well. In terms of the sample forum schedule, you can see uh, how we structured the forums. Uh, typically, we could uh, do a pilot or a practice forum in about 60 minutes, but uh, with a, a public forum or one with a community group, uh, 90 minutes was more uh, the, um, the time frame. Uh, and you can see the key pieces to the, to the forum uh, process included setting ground rules, starting with a question or a video about the issue, uh, getting people's reactions, experiences, and insights with the issue through a series of questions, and introducing at most maybe three or four different options or viewpoints on that issue and exploring those further. Uh, there was also some space if uh, the community groups had um, already done uh, some work on this issue to provide an update on, on those progress and get some feedback from uh, the community on their strategies and what resources might be available to help them move forward. Uh, so on the, the topic of hunger at school, as you can see for, as a sample forum, uh, the three options or three different viewpoints that were presented uh, focused on uh, different sectors and different stakeholders. One option focused on more community-based solutions such as a food pantry or community gardens. Another option focused on school-based uh, solutions such as accessing USDA uh, summer lunch program uh, resources. And the other uh, option focused more on agriculture and farm organizations uh, coming up with solutions uh, through things such as the Farm to School Initiative and Invest in Acre. So in terms of the how of community forums, um, one of the great uh, products that resulted from this work was a video that uh, one young person <clears throat> put together uh, that kind of cooked down uh, to 10 topics or 10 tips that uh, were recommended for uh, communities wanting to, uh, to do youth-led forums. I wanted to point out this uh, young person in particular had served on a statewide team and uh, had been both involved in facilitating forums herself and also uh, coaching other youth uh, that we work with. And so she was involved uh, in, in the writing of the script as well as even the artwork uh, included in the YouTube video. This YouTube video is linked at the, the bottom here and will also um, show you how to access it again at the end of this session. Um, but you can see uh, 10 uh, tips that uh, are recommended for, for groups who uh, wish to uh, implement forums. The first five really focus on uh, a group's preparation uh, for conducting a forum and some considerations to be taken. The second five, six through ten, really focus on facilitation and provide some tips uh, for youth facilitators uh, as they begin uh, to, uh, to get involved.
So let me talk about uh, the why now of, of this uh, practice and uh, how, how, why we have seen it uh, uh, being so effective in helping communities with their uh, healthy lifestyles work. The first is that uh, youth uh, being in visible uh, leadership roles um, is not the norm in our society and communities uh, typically will become more curious and more interested when youth are given the opportunity to be out in front and often that uh, then leads to uh, support. Uh, secondly, uh, it should be noted that uh, youth bring a lot of credibility to the process both as spokespersons for their peers as they're helping to moderate and facilitate but also uh, being able to provide first-hand experience with uh, many of the health issues that communities are working on. Um, and we found as well that uh, oftentimes communities are starting from a place where adults have uh, a narrow or limited view of youth and what they can do. And by uh, providing uh, youth-led forums, uh, this really stretches um, adult opinions on what youth are capable of and uh, over time we have seen uh, actually leads to some changes in uh, the uh, options that communities see they have for addressing these issues uh, or what we could call even a shift in cultural capital uh, over time. And so uh, bringing it uh, back to uh, a few pointers uh, from youth for youth, uh, you can see that uh, often youth will be intimidated by uh, conducting or being a part of a forum at first since it is so new, uh, but as they um, practice and become more comfortable with the roles, they, they have told us that it's very empowering, it's informative, and, and it's just a lot of fun. Uh, they recommend to other youth uh, practicing facilitation basics, things like how to deal with silence uh, among a group, um, how to uh, balance participation so no one dominates, um, they also have recognized that these skills of being in front of a group are transferable to other things they're doing in school and in career. Um, there's also certainly an emphasis on uh, for the adults involved in helping youth to understand group process, how to ask open-ended questions, maybe how to rephrase a question if uh, a first attempt is, is not going, going anywhere. And, and also uh, to be aware of verbal and nonverbal uh, communication uh, as much uh, is being said perhaps that may not be uh, spoken. A few tips uh, then for adults who would work with youth uh, to prepare them for the leading forums. Uh, we have found it's very important if, if adults uh, start by helping uh, groups understand the value of dialogue prior, prior to jumping into action. Uh, if, if the group is able to uh, really flesh out the issue they're working on and to involve others in that discussion, oftentimes there are other approaches or other uh, uh, solutions to the issue that uh, may not have presented. And so um, the old adage of uh, going slow to go fast um, has uh, applied. Also learning the forum process and the moderator rule, uh, roles yourself uh, is important. Uh, and uh, the uh, National Issues Forum our NIFI.org is uh, a fantastic resource uh, where you can find uh, that information for resources. Uh, do expect that you may be reluctant and lack confidence in themselves uh, to do this. Uh, so do set modest expectations for first forums we would recommend and then certainly the value of practice uh, over and over. Um, youth may have to be led through their parts and lines as uh, facilitators and uh, reporters uh, for uh, for the first time, like practicing a play, but uh, as they grow comfortable with them over time, uh, they uh, learn to improvise and uh, they're just amazing. A few tips for uh, community forums and how to work with uh, community organizations. Um, we would recommend setting up a forum discussions with groups who uh, know your group and uh, who you know um, and uh, have, uh, as it were, staged uh, forums uh, in small groups before attempting uh, larger uh, public settings. Um, in addition, uh, consider neutral community settings that uh, provide accessibility for your audience and also times that are uh, doable for both youth and adults. Um, also, it would be recommended that uh, groups select an issue uh, that uh, 
is uh, attainable or that uh, can uh, be impacted, and also uh, to consider uh, the controversy or the volatility of an issue and probably to avoid those issues first and start with issues that uh, are a little more um, uh, gathering. And finally, um, think about, and this is especially applies to uh, small communities in rural areas, to potentially take the forum to an existing event rather than staging uh, your own meeting, as we found through experience that this may help groups to, to get a crowd, especially the first time or two that they are um, that they are attempting. And so, in conclusion, um, we uh, have several resources that we hope folks can uh, take advantage of. One is the 10 tips uh, video that was referenced earlier, and you can access that on YouTube. Uh, also, uh, there is information about the National 4-H Engaging Youth Serving Community Program and a resource manual that provides uh, uh, this in kind of information for communities wanting to implement youth forums. And then, again, we'd also refer you to the NIFI.org website uh, where there is a great deal of resources for educators uh, for middle school and high school groups. Um, and uh, a number of, of issue uh, books um, that uh, hopefully you can find uh, useful. Um, and so in conclusion, um, we want to again make the point that through our, our work on this initiative uh, that youth-led community forums are a valuable tool for communities working on health initiatives. The youth engagement is essential to the success of those initiatives because youth are the key informants and stakeholders and that by giving young people leadership in community discussions that really can energize and inform your community efforts while preparing the next generation to be skilled facilitators, problem solvers, and change makers. So we wish you the best of luck um, in putting these ideas to work and uh, we'd be happy to take uh, some questions on this segment before we move forward. Okay, I think we'll go on to the next uh, presenter then, and uh, John is up next. Hi, everybody. Uh, as Steve said, I'm John Stemmel, uh, Assistant Professor of Strategic Communication at the Missouri School of Journalism, and I'm also the Director of the Health Communication Research Center. Uh, today I'd like to talk to you all about using photo voice as a tool for change and youth advocacy. So let's start out by discussing exactly what advocacy is. According to the World English Dictionary, advocacy is defined as active support, especially of a cause. In my work with the HCRC, when we talk about advocacy, it typically deals with health. As we begin talking with the folks at the University of Missouri's Healthy Lifestyle Initiative, it was clear we were both looking to do a project that would work to improve the health of Missourians, particularly among children. So this slide gives you an in idea of where Missouri stood with some of the key health indicators, including obesity, diabetes, and high blood pressure at the time we started the work. Uh, then you throw in problems with smoking levels, having the lowest cigarette tax in the nation, and ranking last in the U.S. in funding for public health. And you can see we had plenty of options to choose from of how we directed uh, directed our project. The picture wasn't much better for children in most parts of the state, especially down in the Boot Heel area, and that's the southeast. Uh, and there, many areas outside of the middle strip of the state were really hurting when it came to health outcomes. So after looking at all this information, we had to ponder the big question. What could we do to attempt to change these health trends and change attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors of children about exercise and nutrition? So the answer that we came up with uh, was using a method called photo voice. And I'd like to give you a little bit of background on photo voice for those who, who haven't heard of it or haven't been part of it before. It was originally developed in the early 1990s by Carolyn Wang and Mary Ann Burris 
they were working in the Yunnan province in China with women who were living in rural farming communities, and uh, they wanted to find a way for those women to tell their stories and try to improve their, their situation. So Wang and Burris came up with the idea of having women take pictures of their environment and add captions to tell their stories. This practice provided insights into the circumstances of those women and allowed them to represent their community and their environment to try and change things for the better. So how does this all work? It's actually a pretty simple idea if you take it step by step. First thing you do is you select the theme you want to focus on. Uh, this could be the conditions women deal with in a rural farming community in China or the health of children in communities in Missouri. As you can see, pretty wide range you have to deal with. Um, the next thing you do is gather your team. That's both the individuals who will lead the project and the participants. That's followed by having the participants take photos and write captions. And uh, this step also includes training the participants in what photo voice is, how to use a camera, how to take good photos, and what makes a good caption. And then you repeat the steps of taking photos and writing captions over and over again. Uh, you'll do this several times. This allows participants to develop their eye for photos, uh, their voice for writing captions, and to get comfortable with the whole process. During this time, the participants and the facilitators should be looking at the photos and the captions coming in and seeing what kind of commonality of subject matter is arising. And this will culminate with the group looking for, through the photos and picking out the ones that best unite them in a common theme and an ask. Uh, basically, that's what the group decides they want to try to change based on the original theme. Then finally, the group creates an advocacy plan and hopefully gets the change that they hoped for. Now this slide uh, talks about how this change happens and it's the community change process model. So we'll kind of go through this step by step. The first step is the community exposure. This is where the community is introduced to the idea and the problem. And the exposure can take the form of media stories, promotional posters, invitations to attend an exhibit of the photos. Uh, could be at a city council meeting, a school board meeting, really any way you can get the message out to the public. Because without that exposure to the public and the stakeholders, uh, they may not be aware of the idea or the problem being presented. The next step is for the community uh, increased awareness of the issues. This is where the community has heard about the issue, so they've read it in the newspaper or online, they've been to a city council meeting, what have you, uh, but they don't have the full story. So for our project, for Photo Voice Missouri, the photos and the captions provided community members with insight into the perspective of the needs of the students who were taking the photos. The third step is engagement. At this point, the community members are aware and understand about the idea or the problem, and the engagement is where the community members are now involved in the process and actively working to help solve it. They're working to act for the change. Finally, the last step is social change. This is where the community members take concrete action to respond to the issues and the problem. Uh, for Photo Voice Missouri, this is where the community, after looking at the photos and hearing or seeing the stories of the students, move to change policies or enact legislation to fix the problems that the students brought up. So how exactly do you create this change? There are many ways, but the primary goal is to get the problem seen and heard by the public, as I mentioned earlier. And you can do this through the media, like opinion pieces, editorials, or letters to the editor. Uh, or you can take it right to the community leaders and stakeholders by presenting your work to a city council meeting, having a photo exhibit where key stakeholders are invited, or distributing the photo voice work in a printed form or online. Now that we've gone through how change happens, let's talk about more uh, about what photo voice is about. Traditionally, um, public health interventions are done from the top down. In the world of academia, we call this an ivory tower approach. And people go into the community and they tell them, this is what the intervention is going to be, and that's that. With photo voice, there is none of this ivory tower type of mentality. The participants choose the direction the project goes. They get a chance for their issues, concerns, and problems to be heard. And that's, that's very different from a traditional intervention model. 
Photovoid also allows individuals to record and reflect the strengths and problems in their community, identify important issues through group discussion and photographs, and ideally get the attention of politicians and other key stakeholders to try and make that difference that you're shooting for. Along with the things we've already mentioned, people who participate in PhotoVoice get a chance to connect with others who have the same issues and problems so they don't feel alone in their concerns. They get to learn marketable skills such as photography and public speaking. Participants get to level the playing field by speaking to key stakeholders about their concerns and it shows them how to break down some of the barriers that they've run up against trying to create change in the past. All of these are very empowering to those who participate given that PhotoVoice is typically done with those who haven't previously had a say in how change occurred. As far as the cost for doing photo voice, they're quite minimal. You need to have a camera to do it, but almost everyone has a cell phone these days that is more than adequate enough for taking photos. Then you probably need computer access to download the photos and write the captions. Uh, you need some time since the process isn't something that can just be done overnight. And last, you may have some financial costs for printing a booklet or renting a space for an exhibition or other things regarding showing of the photo voice work. There are a few basic photo voice principles that should be adhered to as well. Uh, if you take photos of people, try to avoid, avoid invading someone's privacy. You wouldn't want someone taking a photo of you without permission, so it's best not to do that to somebody else. Ideally, try to get people to sign a consent form, although legally you don't need this if you take photos of people in a public place. You should also try to stay true to photo voice values, such as not manipulating photos. Um, what I mean by this is avoiding a lot of Photoshop manipulation, like when the National Enquirer puts an alien head on someone else's body. If you want to brighten the photo or crop the photo, that's, that's okay, but no National Enquirer sorts of things. Uh, the big one is the last one listed here, and that's showing your world and not a world that you don't know. This means that participants should take photos and write about problems that are relevant to them and not things that they wouldn't normally see and do. When it comes to captions, they should be represented truthfully in a journalistic fashion, and they should try to use the acronym SHOWED. And what SHOWED stands for is what do you see happening here? What is really happening? How does this relate to our lives? Why does this problem, condition, or asset exist? How could this image educate the community, policymakers, or others? And what can we do about it? Now, you don't have to use all of these things in one caption. That would be quite a long caption. Uh, but you should try to encapsulate as many of them as you can and then fit. So why does this work? Um, now that I've been involved with Photo Voice for a few years, I have kind of a good idea about the, the why. From my experience and the research that we've read and that we've done ourselves, the reason that Photo Voice is effective is that when it comes to health, people don't typically remember data and statistics. However, they do remember stories, and that's what Photo Voice is about. It's about telling personal stories in order to create change. And that takes us to Photo Voice Missouri, which is the project that the HCRC has been working on with the Healthy Lifestyle Initiative here at the University of Missouri Extension. As Steve so ably pointed out, the Healthy Lifestyle Initiative is a community-based program run in Missouri that aims to increase the number of people with access to healthy, affordable, locally produced food and participating in safe, accessible physical activity. Uh, my group, the Health Communication Research Center, uses evidence-based practices to create interventions that work with communities and try to improve health outcomes through communication and marketing practices. Oh, uh, I, I'm going to pause real quick to go back a slide. I'm, I apologize. I am from New Jersey, so sometimes I can speak really fast. Uh, Catherine, you'd asked what the W is in uh, showed, and it's why does this problem, condition, or asset exist? Okay, back to the webinar. Um, 
Okay, and as far as the Health Communication Research Center, what we do is we use evidence-based practices to create interventions that work with communities to try and improve health outcomes through communication and marketing practices. So for our Photo Voice Missouri project, our theme that we've been doing the last few years is healthy lifestyles. And so what we're doing is working with middle and high school students in mostly rural areas, along with a few metro areas. Uh, we've worked with teachers in these schools to incorporate photo voice into their classes, like English and uh, facts or home ec, uh, journalism classes, health classes, uh, phys ed, whatever seems to fit. Or we've done it with after school programs, such as 4-H. All the work is posted online on a Flickr page, and the goal is for the students to do their photo voice work to advocate for community change that they have decided upon. And I think that uh, this video will help you see kind of what we've been up to. the project last year I saw the top photos and I saw the other students captions and I was just really impressed by the issues that they were addressing and I knew that this is something that I wanted Ferguson to be able to work on. This project is a great way to get a youth perspective on the health needs and the health assets in our community. We learned about the unhealthy things that we could focus on more and how we could fix it and everything. Putting captions to these photos really uh, gives us a tool to um, advocate to make changes and to improve the healthy living opportunities uh, around our school and throughout the community. Kids my age do have the power if they were to put it into action or into motion that they could actually voice their thoughts but it's just a matter of pushing them in the direction of saying you can do this. It's a very um, good project for awareness for kids. It gives them ideas and gives them the voice and makes them think. We had a couple uh, groups of students that really took a hold of the project and uh, wanted to create a better environment for the school. The pictures just told the story and then when they were writing their captions they started showing their teachers and then administration became interested and they were really surprised that students took notice of such detail. If we show the pictures then they're going to eventually be cut. Some of the stuff like I want to take pictures of is embarrassing to our school. So it's like if we take the pictures, then they're going to be like, well, this is embarrassing. So we better cover that up and fix that. Last year, in the beginning, we weren't quite sure we were, what we were getting into, but it turned out to be something that was great for our community. And we've got sidewalks hopefully going to be coming in around campus and just a great way to get kids out and exercising. So I hope some kids who like taking pictures and will help the environment will get together and clean up this town. So most of the kids that I work with are 10, 11, 12 years old, and you think they really haven't gotten a voice or an opinion about healthy living, but they really have. We all have our special ideas and opinions that we think could help the community and it's also a good way for the adults to take a look at the things that they're not able to see every day like the schools and the place where the younger kids hang out and stuff like that. Not only just being able to fix those problems but seeing the ideas of other people and their perspective and how they think would help it is a really cool opportunity. It is really neat because we never really get to express our opinions. I mean. Even in all volunteer opportunities, they're always just really looking for adults. It lets you focus on the negatives more than the positives, and you can see that 
all the things come together and it could actually change. They were taking pictures of things around the school that would that they would like to have fixed and you know granted not all of them got fixed but people noticed that that is a problem and so I just think in and that of itself was something that was powerful for the kids. We know that these voices are being heard. From Dallas to Shelby County, changes are afoot. Some of the changes were simple, like at Marion Middle School, where the photos from last year altered policies about serving junk food as snacks for after-school activities. Or at North Shelby High School, where along with getting some potholes in the school parking lot fixed, students began conversations about how to change the world around them to live healthier lifestyles. In Rawls County, student photos of the condition of the bleachers and stadium at Mark Twain High School resulted in a community-wide effort that raised $13,000 for repairs. In Dallas County, photos taken by Buffalo Middle School students showed the need for new and better sidewalks around the schools. This led the way for the city to vote for more funding and to apply for a grant to get these things done. Okay, um, hopefully I was, I was able to answer some questions during that video. Hopefully uh, everyone got a sense of what we did. Um, but there is more about what we've learned than just that. Um, so first, one of the things we found is that students taking part in photo voice typically follow this kind of student change process model. Although it takes a bit of time, uh, they start by getting out there, taking the photos, and looking at the health of their communities with an ever-sharpening eye. As they take the photos and write the captions, they begin talking about their work in a group setting. Students see that they're being heard, which is validating for them and for their ideas. Through this, they begin to find their voice, both as individuals and as a group, and in the group setting, they can begin to see the bigger picture. Instead of just taking a picture of a, creek, a creaky playground equipment or a running path, they suddenly can see how these things are barriers or possible solutions to improving the health of their communities. Finally, by taking photos and writing captions, working in a group, and advocating for change, they experience personal growth and they see that their voices matter and they can work to make wherever they live a better place. Now, for a teenager, learning that they can make a difference is a really powerful idea. Other things that we've learned are that students really enjoy the non-traditional learning of photo voice. Instead of being taught information just for a test, they get to think outside the box a bit and they get some hands-on classroom work experience. Um, I, I do want to just kind of add in, we expected it would to be the high achieving students who really would seek this out, but it turned out it was the students that typically didn't do well in school, the C students, uh, those that the teachers didn't think were going to be college bound, were the ones that really liked this. And over time, we found a lot of those students found kind of a new path for life. They enrolled in photo classes or wanted to go to college to learn photography. So it, that, that was really heartening for us. Um, along with that, we found that students were very excited about having control of the project. It usually took a few weeks for them to actually believe that they were in control. We had to kind of remind them, yes, you are really in control. You're, you're, you are guiding how this is going to go. And once they realized that, they really started to love it. Uh, I talked about the participation with the high achievers is who we thought, and it wound up being those who uh, typically weren't high achievers in the past. And many students were skeptical about the project to start with. But that did fade over time, and their feelings for activism increased. Now, what we did as part of this process, uh, one of the things our center always does is make sure that there's some kind of research component. We want to evaluate what we've done and try to create some best practices and learn from any missteps that we take. So we did a pre and a post survey with each student who participated and asked them a battery of questions. Uh, and one of them was this. 
we asked them, I personally know a lot about photo voice. Now, as you'd expect, most of them had never heard of it before. And by the end of the project, they understood far more about it. They understood what it could do. Another thing that we asked them was, um, do you think photo voice is important? And by the end of the project, we found the students believed that photo voice could be an important process to creating change. And all these were statistically significant. The next thing we asked was, photo voice can help change, create change in my community. And you can see an increase in those who thought photo voice was helpful in making change in their communities happen. Yes, this, it was a one to five scale. Somebody just asked what the scale was. Yes, it was a one to five scale. Um, Finally, a big goal of this project was to use photo voice as a tool to help students improve their self-esteem. From this item, you can see that students at the end of the project had a more positive attitude about themselves than when they began. So even if their efforts at advocacy didn't result in change through no fault of their own, the process still made a difference on a personal level. And we've, we started this in the 2011-2012 school year. Uh, so we've got results from that year. We've got results from the 2012-13 year. And we're currently getting results from the 2013-14 school year. Uh, I believe we have run about 200 students through the program total. Uh, and that will increase by, I think, about 50 more students this year. So that is all that I've got for you today. Uh, here is my contact information in case you'd like to learn more about this project or if I can, uh, I'd be happy to provide you with a copy of the materials as well. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to take those for a little bit before turning it over to Melissa. So thank you. Okay, got a question. Um, is the Photo Voice project led by volunteers? Actually, no. Um, what we have is we have uh, some grant funding from the Healthy Lifestyle Initiative to conduct this project, and it's the HCRC staff which actually run the project. Uh, what we do is we do visits in the fall to kind of help them through photo voice, writing captions, taking photos, and then we return in the spring and kind of guide them through the advocacy process. However, we do try to let them do as much as they can on their own. We really don't want to intervene in their process. We're merely there to assist as needed. And the students will guide the process, and the teachers are kind of the buffer between us and between them. Any other questions that I can answer? Uh, were teachers in the school compensated? No. Um, what we did is we actually put out a call to all the different healthy lifestyle communities, both to high schools and middle schools, and asked if any teachers would be interested in doing this and incorporating it into their curriculum or into after-school programs. And we actually had a huge response. Uh, the teachers were wonderful and willing to do this. Uh, we were kind of surprised. The first year, um, I think we had 10 teachers involved. Second year, it went up to 12. Uh, and this year, we actually um, had far more than we could accommodate. Uh, I think we had 20 to 25 teachers wanting to be involved. So what we did is we've, we, took them, we trained them in the summer, and then they could do it on their own. We just couldn't include them in our hands-on part of the process. We are currently working on a manual, though, for our Photo Voice Missouri process, uh, and we hope to make that available soon. I did want to make everyone available. Uh, here is the information if you want to check out our Flickr page. Uh, this, the photos are all grouped by year and by uh, county, so you can see some of those and the kind of photos and, and information the students were interested in. 
we get a lot of photos of broken up sidewalks. Um, and you can see some difference between the middle school kids and the high school kids, but really some brilliant things that the students are doing. We, we have just been thrilled by the response that we've gotten. Did students tackle an environmental issue? Given that our main theme was healthy lifestyles, uh, if you mean environment like uh, garbage and that sort of thing, we did have students take pictures of those things. Uh, we were wide open to anything around health students wanted to take, and all of that is up on Flickr. Um, but as far, but typically they did stick with exercise and nutrition and um, built environment, so sidewalks, roads, potholes, that sort of thing. Did we have any issues with privacy or publishing photos? We did not. All of the students also had to sign, and the students and the parents all had to sign release forms for this. Um, and when we publish the photos, we only use the first name of the student and the name of the school. We don't identify them any further than that. Uh, and so we, we haven't had any problems with that. And evaluate, uh, we did have an evaluation component. The evaluation component was our pre and our post survey. Uh, our pre and post survey, the first year was humongous. I think we had 160 questions. Um, the students basically had to take it home like a homework assignment to finish it. Uh, since then, we, we've adapted and we've cut it down to 64 questions. And so what we do is we just compare the pre and the post to see what kind of changes have we had. Um, what kind of things have the students learned? We've also each year done teacher in-depth interviews to find out what kind of things can we learn from the teachers to improve the process. Um, as far as the advocacy and the change, as you'd expect, they, they run, the project runs from August through the end of March, right before our state testing kicks in here in Missouri. So a lot of times, the advocacy doesn't happen until after that year's project is over. So typically, it's a good six months or more before we find out, did change actually happen? Uh, as you saw in the video for Rawls and Shelby, uh, St. Louis, and Dallas, all of that basically happened in the second year. It was efforts from the first year of the project that didn't appear until the second year. Hope, hopefully, I've answered the evaluation question, but if I haven't, let me know. See another question coming. I, uh, this might be the last one or the next to last one. I want to give Melissa plenty of time to give her talk as well. Uh, do we have a method to track change over time? Through the surveys, we can track change within a school. However, because it's teachers leading the process, the students will not be in the same class each year. Um, so we can't do any kind of uh, any kind of real panel study where we follow the students over time. But we can see if through the schools we see any change. Uh, and we do follow up with teachers about that. So year to year we kind of, we do see some changes happening, as again, as you saw in the video, but we can't really track the students over time. Okay, I could probably take one more question and then I want to make sure I hand it over. And again, if anyone has any further questions or would like copies of the PowerPoint presentation, just shoot me an email and I'll make sure to get that to you. Um, I'm happy to provide any information I can about the process. Okay, well, thank you all very much and I will turn it over to Melissa. Thank you so much, John, and hello everybody. Um, and yep, that's my picture. Um, so I am thrilled to be here today to talk to you about um, two topics I'm passionate about. Um, so youth participatory action research and youth adult partnerships. Um, and before we get started, I wanted to point out that my contact information is on this first slide. Um, after this presentation, um, certainly you know, ask questions throughout the presentation and I'll try to address them when I can and there will be some time for some Q&A at the end. Um, but if you have any other questions at all, please feel free to email me. Um, these are two topics I love to talk about, so you will not be bothering me at all. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about um, 
the how and who of engaging youth. Um, the how being youth participatory action research and the who being youth adult partnerships. And it's interesting because Steve and John both address some components of youth participatory action research and youth adult partnerships in both of their presentations. And so I would invite you to think about how what they said relates to these more broad and general um, topics as I kind of move through these slides. And so before we get started, um, I think one of the things that uh, my school and community partners often struggle with um, is that they hear a lot of these great ideas and get really excited, but quickly become very overwhelmed. Um, and so this is often um, something that I share with um, the folks I work with, just so that um, people can see where they can start and how they can proceed in doing some of this work. Um, so this is just a basic problem solving process um, an evaluation cycle. Many of you are, are probably very familiar with something similar to this, but just this idea that I find that when people become overwhelmed, if they can figure out where they are in this cycle, it helps them decide where they should go next. So the idea that we're always in this process of assessing, planning, implementing, or evaluating. And so in the assessment phase, we want to step back and say, what is our goal? What are we already doing? And what are our resources? After that, we can move on to the, the plan phase and decide what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, and how we'll know if we're, how we'll know if we're successful. In the implement phase, we, we think about how well are we implementing our plan, and then in evaluate, asking what worked, what didn't work, and what we can do better in the future. Something important about this problem-solving cycle and, and all cycles like, that are similar to this is that you can start anywhere. So if you're already implementing something that relates to the content you're hearing in this webinar, then you can just move forward to think about how you're going to evaluate it. And again, using that data to move forward in this cycle again. So youth participatory action research. So we define youth participatory action research as a collaborative approach to research that equitably involves all, all partners in the research process and recognizes the unique strengths that each bring, the unique strengths that each brings. And for youth participatory action research, we're focusing specifically on including youth as those critical partners um, in this process. So as you think about youth participatory action research, you're probably already familiar with a lot of other types of action research that people often use um, to describe the same kind of process. So you might be familiar with terms like community-based participatory research or CBPR, youth participatory evaluation or YPE, referring to things as their acronyms, which we all do a lot more than we probably should. So PAR or PAR or YPAR, this idea of EPAR, which is basically participatory action research with technology. Photo voice, as John was describing, um, is a, a very popular form of participatory action research, particularly with youth. And again, a, a empowerment evaluation. And so I show you these um, just to make sure that we're all talking about, that we're all thinking about the same thing when I'm talking about youth participatory action research. So there's a lot of different terms and a lot of different approaches. And all of these are distinct in some way, but there are some key, key components across them and key components for um, youth participatory action research. So to begin, youth participatory action research is participatory. It's in the name, so this is um, pretty obvious. But the idea with this is that this is research, research with, not on a population. And so as John was highlighting, traditionally research, researchers have worked worked on or done research on communities, not with communities. Um, and this has led to a whole bunch of different issues. Um, but participatory, um, the value of participation in research and youth participatory action research in particular um, is really based um, or is really driven by a few different components. One is basic respect. And so this idea that folks who engage in this type of research respect the communities and populations they work with and show that respect by engaging with them rather than doing research on them. Another re reason for participation or participatory action research um, is this idea that um, taking a more participatory approach actually improves the quality of the research that we do in a variety of ways. So for example, working with a population, in this case youth, improves the questions that we ask. It helps us ask better questions. Um, it also 
and proves how we ask the questions and what we ask. And John's example through the Photo Voice project was a really great um, example of how working with youth actually improves the quality of our research. And then finally, um, another sort of driving force for participation in research is the idea that when we include um, the community or population we're doing research with in the actual process, it makes it more likely that our research will have an impact at the end. So historically, researchers would go into a community, collect data, and leave. And often folks in that community would say, hang on, wait, what do we get out of this? Um, and there was very limited direct impact on the folks who are participating in that research. One of the, uh, the goals of participatory approaches is to um, reduce the probability that research does not have a direct impact, and we do that by working directly with people. Another key component of participatory um, youth participatory action research is that it's inclusive. And so what this means is that we include the people who we're doing research with and, and the, who, the primary population who we're interested in understanding. And so historically, um, research was completed by researchers who worked at, in academia, and very often the folks who were actually involved in um, providing data were not included in that process. Um, and the value of being inclusive in this type of research is really driven by the idea that we need to make sure that we are including the most vulnerable populations in research in a way that is respectful. Um, and so this, this type of re research has been done with a lot of different vulnerable, vulnerable populations um, over the past 30, 40 years. More recently, um, people have recognized that youth are actually a vulnerable population in the research process and have recognized that youth can be essential partners in making this research work. I'd also like to add that when we think about including youth in research, um, we're not just talking about high school youth, we're not just talking about high achieving youth. Um, as John was pointing out, oftentimes um, the, the young people who are the most excited to get involved in these process processes aren't the, the youth that we would typically think are um, excited about getting involved. Um, and again, back to that value of being inclusive, we want to make sure that we are including all youth. Um, and so there are some um, recently published studies of um, researchers partnering with youth as young as preschool age to do evaluation projects. Um, certainly lots of instances of um, folks partnering with elementary age youth, um, low achieving youth, um, youth who have dropped out of school. And so when we're thinking about including um, youth in these types of partnerships, we want to make sure we're thinking about all the youth. And then finally, another key component across all these different types of research, but certainly a component of youth participatory action research, is this idea that it's a systematic process of understanding, addressing, and or evaluating. But again, there's a lot of different variation in these different, in these different types of research, but those are some of the key components. So when we think about the primary process, that systematic process that's a part of youth participatory action research, research we're looking at these five different steps. The first being that we ask a question. So asking what is the problem, what is the issue, and what should we focus on? The second is deciding how we're going to answer the question. So who are we going to ask? How are we going to ask them? When are we going to ask them? Where are we going to ask them? Kind of the logistics of, of the research process. Third, we're going to gather that information to answer our question. And then moving forward, we're going to use that information to answer our questions. So what did we learn? What does this mean? We're interpreting the data here. And then finally, this important step that John also highlighted, action. So now what? Now that we've answered this question, now what are we going to do with it? And I'd like to point out that you can be involved throughout this process in every single step. And so I have some examples here that I wanted to talk through just to make this a little bit more concrete. So in the step where we're asking the question, there's some different activities that could be taking place. We could be developing a question, prioritizing a question, or finding a question, and oftentimes we're doing all three of these. So for example, a group would come together and ask, why are our, why are our neighborhood youth not getting enough exercise? So that's developing a question, developing a, a specific problem or issue to focus on. But then that actually leads to a whole lot of questions, and we would need to prioritize a question. So why don't youth use the neighborhood playground? That could be one um, prioritized question among many questions that might emerge from sort of this broad, more general question. And then finally, refining the question. So what would make youth feel safer using the playground? So the idea of general to specific. 
and then we go, we move forward to decide how to answer the question. So who? Who has the information we need to answer the question we identified? How are we going to collect information? Are we going to do a survey? Are we going to do focus groups? Are we going to do observation photographs? And then when and where? So the, lo the logistics of this. How, and really, this is asking how can we collect the best information? If we want to ask young people on the playground how they feel about safety, we might want to go to the playground to ask them um, so that we make sure that we're getting the best information to answer that question. The third step, gathering information. So preparing and organizing. So figuring out materials, logistics, and format. Again, youth can be involved in every step of this process in lots of different ways. Recruitment, so finding and inviting participants. And then finally, data collection. So distributing surveys, conducting interviews. And then once we have that information, we move forward to answer the question. So organizing the data, so for example, entering data into a spreadsheet, analyzing the data, for example, look for themes from focus groups, and interpreting the data. So in this, we're, we want to connect the findings back to the question. And then finally, the action step. So disseminating findings, for example, present at a community forum, um, such as a youth-led community forum, as Steve was describing, you know, providing this information in a blog, moving forward with policy and ad advocacy, so writing a letter to the editor, holding a town hall meeting, and developing additional questions, so continuing that research and evaluation cycle. So in terms of practical strategies, I identified sort of three big picture suggestions if you're interested in um, working with youth um, to engage in participatory action research. So I think the first one is being purposeful. So what is the goal of working with youth um, on this research topic? Why youth participatory research? Um, not all research is designed to be participatory, and not all research should include youth. But more research could include youth, and more research could be participatory. So just being purposeful about that goal. And thinking big, again, you can participate in every step of the research and evaluation process. Um, and there's lots of examples out there in the literature and also in practice. Um, you absolutely can be involved in collecting and analyzing data, which is often the step they're um, excluded from. And so thinking about how you would in include youth in all of the, the different steps. And then finally, starting small. So if you're interested in starting to engage in this process, process look at current activities. Um, and where you could enhance what you're already doing through action research with youth. And then finally, support youth and adults through the process. And I emphasize the and adults here because I think often we, we think about the need to support youth in research and we ignore the adults, but adults need just as much support through this process um, as youth do. So those are some practical strategies and a review of youth participatory action research. The next topic I'm going to, to, to discuss is youth-adult partnerships. And again, Steve and John identified um, or discussed lots of youth-adult partnership issues in their webinars, and I'm going to highlight um, some of some popular models or some new models for looking at youth-adult partnerships and being very purposeful about them. And I have this, um, this quote here from Yogi Berra um, because I think it's a good, it, it identifies some of the challenges that actually come with youth-adult partnerships. So he said, in theory, there is no difference between theory and practice, but in practice there is. And I think this can often be the case with many things, but certainly with youth adult partnerships. So in theory, youth adult partnerships are highly valued, beneficial, and very common. I would imagine many of you all are engaged in some type of youth adult partnership. But youth adult partnerships can also be complicated, difficult, and missed opportunities. And so today I'm gonna to talk about a couple different models um, that hopefully will be useful so that you can be purposeful in youth adult partnerships to make sure that we're maximizing the benefits of those partnerships. So one is that youth adult partnerships are diverse. There's no one right or wrong way for adults to partner with youth. Um, and th these partnerships look very different in different um, contexts and around different tasks. Youth adult partnerships vary considerably in terms of control and power. I'm going to talk a little bit more um, about control and power and how some folks approach thinking about this in youth adult partnerships in a second. Um, but the idea is youth adult partnerships are very diverse um, and they consider uh, or they vary considerably. Youth adult partnerships evolve, so just as individuals develop and evolve, so do partnerships. 
These partnerships take work. Um, youth and adults need support to partner effectively. Um, and so Steve was talking about adultism um, and how that can affect youth engagement. And certainly youth and adults, and particularly adults sometimes, need a lot of support to partner, effective, to partner effectively. The idea that youth and adults have different perspectives and that preparation is key. And I think the, the, the main point that I would want to emphasize with this is that I believe best practice in terms of youth adult partnerships means that they are purposeful partnerships, that they're planned, that they're considered. And when we think about all of these different factors that affect youth adult partnerships, that we're thinking through them and trying to be purposeful in these partnerships. And this idea that the best youth adult partnerships fit the task and context. So just as I was talking before about how not all research should include youth or should be participatory, um, the idea is that different contexts and tasks call for different types of partnerships. So there's several different um, theories or approaches or models for youth adult partnerships and participation in general. Um, one of the most widely known um, model for participation is Roger Hart's Ladder of Participation. And many of you all have probably seen this um, and gone through it in, in some detail. Um, and the idea with this is that um, the youth adult partnerships are characterized according to the rungs of the ladder. Um, and as you move up the rungs, youth have more um, leadership and control, um, youth are engaged in the process, um, and youth are informed. And so the idea between the blue and the red is that the red steps are considered non-participation and the blue are considered degrees of participation. And again, that all of these, as you move up and down the rungs, that these, or these partnerships are characterized by differences in power initiation, knowledge, participation, leadership, and control. Um, and so this, um, again, has been a widely used and widely promoted model of participation. Um, but more recently, folks have begun looking at this um, and other types of models and um, suggesting that there might be a different way to think about participation. In, in particular, um, they criticize models that, um, that seem to suggest that one type of partnership is better than another. So the idea that the goal is to get to the top of the ladder and to get to rung eight in this model, um, and that, that, again, because partnerships are diverse and they should fit the context and the task, that we might want to look at things a little bit differently. And so Wong, Zimmerman, and Parker have created the type pyramid. And this is specific to evaluation, um, but rather than research, but again, I think it could be applied across all youth adult partnerships. And the idea with the type pyramid is, as you can see, there's no real right or wrong um, type of partnership as indicated in the model. Their model focuses specifically on empowerment and shared control, empowerment and control, and that idea of adults being in control, youth being in control, or shared control, and then increasing levels of empowerment. So, for example, if you look at the vessel type of partnership, you can see that there's a lack of youth voice and participation, and adults have total control. And we can all probably think of contexts or tasks where a vessel type of partnership would be most appropriate. On the opposite end of the continuum is this idea of an autonomous youth adult partnership. So in this type of partnership, youth have voice and active participant roles, and youth have total control. And again, we can probably think of different types of situations where an autonomous youth adult partnership would be most appropriate. And then in the middle, at the very top of the pyramid, you see this idea of a pluralistic youth adult partnership, which is often what um, folks who are doing work in communities and schools um, are, are trying to establish. So this pluralistic type of partnership where youth have voice and active participant roles and youth and adults share control. So again, two different types, two different models for looking at and considering youth adult partnerships. So the question might be, so what? So these are two great models, but who really cares and how does this apply to my work? Um, well, I think there's actually a lot of um, practical strategies for applying these models um, in terms of supporting purposeful youth adult partnerships. And so I have some listed here, and would certainly love to hear some suggestions that you might have or even examples of how you've done this in your work. Um, so uh, one practical strategy, broadly speaking, is to use the model to clarify values, compare perspectives, guide discussions, develop action plans, and assess progress. And I have some concrete examples here. 
So for example, you could use the language from these models to discuss values regarding youth adult partnerships. For example, who should have control? And then maybe discuss how context or task might shape those values. So maybe in some instances, youth should take the lead, whereas in other instances, adults should really provide more direction. Second, you could use the model to describe your existing youth adult partnerships. And this could be used to orient new members, create awareness of a group in a community, um, and that could be one additional way of using these models. You could also map your current youth adult partnership activities onto one of the models and discuss the implications. Again, where are you now and where do you want to go? And then how will you get there? You could consider the models separately or in groups and compare and contrast results. For example, you could pull youth and adults or participants with different functions and roles into separate groups, have a discussion, and then compare what you found. You could discuss the alignment between values towards and the current status of youth adult partnerships, develop an action plan for enhancing those partnerships, and monitor progress in completing those action plans. Again, I think these models are most useful if you think about how they can apply to your current work. Are you satisfied with your current partnerships? Do you want to change them? How do you want to change them? And how will you know if you were successful in changing them? So again, revisiting that first cycle of assess, plan, implement and evaluate it um, with regards to these practice or with regards to youth adult partnerships. So I'm going to wrap up there um, and see if anybody has any questions um, for me at this point. Also, if you have suggestions um, of, or ideas or examples of um, how you've used models like this or how you've considered youth adult partnerships in your practices, um, we'd also certainly love to hear about that. Um, similarly, if you have comments on um, youth participatory action research, um, you could also share those as well. So it looks like a couple of folks are typing questions, multiple attendees. Um, okay, so may we share this link with colleagues? Um, that's probably a question um, that I would be happy to answer. I would say absolutely. Um, I think this information that we presented and all the resources here are, are designed to um, be shared widely um, and used in, in your work in whatever way makes sense. And certainly to my colleagues who are presenting, feel free to chime in on these questions um, if they're not particular to my presentation. So what is it like, let's see, what is it like to build a partnership with the people in this presentation? So Donna, are you referring to, um, oh, extension journalism teaching. So uh, how have, what's it been like to, for us to build our partnership? Um, I don't know if any of my colleagues have thoughts or, or comments on that. Uh, this is John. It's been great. Uh, <laughs> I, I think uh, we all enjoy reaching out uh, across disciplines and uh, we see the value in working with others. Um, and I think it's hugely helpful, especially when you do these kinds of projects, to work with folks outside of your domain. Because, you know, in journalism, we know how to get messages out, but we don't necessarily have any clue how to work with children. Um, and I think that's, that's a huge help. And likewise, uh, from the 4-H Center, uh, this process has been fantastic to learn more of what uh, our team members are doing. You know, we know a certain amount, um, but even this process and these presentations have uh, exposed us to, to more. And uh, I, I'm sitting here thinking that uh, we have uh, more in common and more things that we can do from here. So it's been, it's been fantastic. There yeah, was a I would question. agree. Go ahead. I was just, I was just going to say I agree. I don't have anything new or novel to add. <laughs> <laughs> there was a question about um, 
you know, gaining commitment from youth to participate. And I sure, you know, uh, invite uh, any of the presenters to respond to that. I will just share that I think one of the keys uh, that we have found is uh, that when youth are involved in the identification of issues and, and areas that they are passionate about or in interested in, um, that's very key to uh, gaining their commitment and keeping their commitment. I think oftentimes they're invited to be involved in things that um, they maybe have a little bit of interest in, but it's not a spark for them or it's not a, a driving passion and, and uh, therefore it's hard to, to get that commitment over time. Um, so if you start with conversations about um, you know, what, what youth really would like to see change or happen in their community, um, sort of the personal experiences with those issues, uh, those things can often be uh, the, the, the starting points of, uh, of uh, commitment over time. And, and just also keeping in mind that because of the stage of life they are at and, and uh, the mobility and, and so forth, that uh, we sometimes have to adjust our adult expectations about what commitment means and uh, the the longevity of that. Um, one one practical um, example is how long we ask youth to serve on a board or council. Uh, we've had to make some adjustments, uh, you know, in that. Uh, for instance, with our our extension councils and. Um, and maybe it's uh, it's just a year, uh, you know, that that a young person can commit um, rather than a long term. But any other thoughts on that question? Uh, I mean, I, I can think, talk um, about. Oh, go, no, go ahead. ahead. Okay, I, I was just going to add, and I absolutely agree with what you're saying, Steve. Um, I think the that participatory approaches and partnerships are often important to look at. Um, I think I, I often work with adults who believe that they are doing. Um, are, are sharing more of the control and the power with youth than they actually are. Um, and so that can, that can sometimes be one of those issues. And, and kind of just coming back and relating it back to what Steve was saying is, I feel like when youth really are um, supported in taking the lead, um, then that often can, can spark their passion and they can focus on the issues they, they are interested in. But again, just like what Steve was saying, and, and I have lots of practical examples of this, um, but I think as adults, we, we don't see the world as youth do. And I think that's why it's important we work with youth, um, and, and especially around changing the structures that we just use. So the idea of meetings um, and how long meetings should be um, and, and what it's like to go to you know a board meeting or these kind of different pieces that we just have a different way of seeing them, I think, than you youth often do, um, and even maybe even asking youth about um, the, the commitment um, issues and what is, you know, barring them from, from being fully committed. Yeah. I'm going to try to do a combo answer here. Uh, <laughs> I agree with everything that Melissa and Steve just said. I will say with our Photo Voice Missouri project, uh, after doing the research about how Photo Voice had been done in the past, typically it's more of an eight to ten week process, uh, nighttime activity, whether it's adults or students. But one of the things a lot of people said was they had a problem with attrition. People would come to the first meeting for the pizza, for the experience, that sort of thing, and then there would be a drop-off. One of the reasons we wanted the team with schools is we knew we'd have more of a captive audience. Students were less apt to drop out of school than they would be if we just kind of ran it for the normal eight to ten weeks. So that was one way we kind of increased participation. But also, I completely agree with Melissa and Steve with making sure that they are the ones driving the process and you are just there to help is, is key. And then when it comes to diversity, with our efforts, we, made, we were very cognizant that we wanted to get, um, we were more interested in rural areas and inner city than we were typical suburbs uh, to make sure that we could increase the diversity, not just with with race, but also with gender and socioeconomic status. So we were very cognizant. We wanted to try to get a good uh, a good range. I see we have one question related to diversity, and uh, I'll maybe see if our team has a response for that. But I'd also ask perhaps Suzanne if you'd go ahead and put up the pod question so that we can uh, invite participants today to uh, give us some feedback on the webinar as we come up to the noon hour. And so we'll take this last question, uh, let folks uh, kind of answer these poll questions to evaluate the webinar, and uh, then, then we'll conclude. So on the topic of diversity, what kind of diversity have we seen? 
seen among youth and what helped achieve that level of diversity. Um, I have to say from our experiences in working with some very small uh, communities um, that uh, the, the, the kinds of, of diversity you might uh, you know, look for uh, along racial or ethnic lines is often uh, not there, although in some communities, many communities of Missouri, uh, we do see uh, uh, some changes, uh, refugee populations and, and immigration uh, trends and so forth. But I, I think we've had to help groups uh, sort of approach the diversity question um, uh, as it relates to the, you know, the actual demographics of, of their area. And so looking at uh, socioeconomic differences, looking at uh, maybe students with differing learning abilities, uh, looking at students who've tended to be involved in everything versus those who uh, are not typically joiners. Um, so those are some of the ways that we've helped them to identify diversity and to think about inclusion. Um, and, and I think we've found that by and large, uh, young people are, are more inclusive of their peers perhaps than, uh, than adults uh, in just making a very general statement. So they seem to be more on, uh, in tune with that than perhaps even, even we are. Um, Melissa or John, any thoughts from you? Yeah, I mean, I, I was actually just thinking what you kind of concluded with, Steve, um, or one of those statements that you concluded with, which is, um, you know, working with um, groups to, to understand their local diversity and, and trying to match that diversity in partnerships. And so um, I do, um, my primary work is in schools. And so thinking about all the diversity that is in schools and maybe not just along, along racial or ethnic lines, um, but certainly socioeconomic status also, as John was pointing out, I mean, your low achievers, your high achievers, um, different career paths. So folks who are heading to college, um, two-year technical schools, uh, maybe, you know, are pursuing a trade. Um, also, um, for me, in my interest, looking for folks who have different types of mental health issues um, and are struggling with different types of disabilities and just making sure that that group is representative of whatever community um, you're working in. Yeah, I, I kind of have the same the same ideas. Uh, I, I think you you want to make sure that you do seek out as much diversity as you can. You can't always guarantee it's going to happen, but at least if you make the attempt to get those people involved, you know, I think that's that a lot of times it's the best you can do, um, and then hopefully you succeed in, in what you're trying to do with diversity. Right. Thanks, and uh, I hope we've been able to catch everyone's questions. If not, uh, feel free to direct those to us by email, and we would be happy to follow up with you uh, in more length. Um, we're going to bring things to a close here, but I just want to uh, express appreciation to our presenter team again, uh, to uh, Zoe and John and Melissa. Uh, also, I wanted to be sure and thank uh, Donna and Suzanne and Jean and the, the Creating Healthy Communities uh, Co-op uh, and, and eExtension for making this webinar possible. Uh, thanks to each of you for joining us today and for uh, making eExtension a, a, a source for uh, these kinds of topics, and we hope that you will do that again in the future. So um, with that, uh, we're going to go ahead and conclude the recording and the webinar, and we hope everybody has uh, a safe and pleasant uh, wintry day. Uh, take care. <laughs> thanks, everybody. Thank you.